tonight, warnings that factories could soon be shut down as high energy costs bite. Steelmakers are among those urging the government to act. Today, one minister agreed the situation for them and others is critical. High gas prices, they've quadrupled this year, um, are making an impact. Uh, and that's why I'm, uh, as you say, speaking to people, listening and trying to work out a way forward. But after the business secretary said he was working with the chancellor on this, the Treasury said that there were no specific talks on supporting industry. Also tonight, the danger of catching COVID and flu at the same time. It could double the risk of death. Inside the world of Kim Jong-un, a former top North Korean spy tells his story. And how our green and pleasant land is threatened as we take space away from nature. Good evening. The business secretary says rising gas prices have created a critical situation for many industries. Steelmakers are among those warning that they may have to stop production because of spiralling energy costs. Today, Kwasi Kwarteng said he was looking at whether existing government support was sufficient and working with the Chancellor. But later, a Treasury source said that no specific talks on this issue had taken place. Here's our business correspondent, Katie Prescott. Ready, Cooking up a classic Sunday brunch for hungry punters. But plating up in this Leeds cafe is getting more expensive. As energy bills rise, they can't just turn off the coffee machine. I'm mainly worried that in the long term the prices won't change and there'll be this kind of idea that because we've dealt with them in this current situation we'll suddenly be normalised to the idea that that's OK to keep those prices the same. We might have to change our prices in the future if the prices don't come down, which could have a knock-on effect on the people that feel like they can come in. The business secretary this morning wouldn't commit to extra support with energy bills for companies like this one. I think it's a critical situation. Uh, clearly, you know, I'm speaking to industry, as you've said, all the time. And high gas prices, they've quadrupled this year. Um, are making an impact. Uh, and that's why I'm, uh, as you say, speaking to people, listening and trying to work out a way forward. Those industries that use a lot of energy for manufacturing say the time for working out a way forward has long gone. If the situation is critical, which I certainly know it is, then why isn't government acting now, today, to address this problem for energy intensive sectors such as the steel industry? Because without that help, now, today, in the next week or so, then we're going to see a significant and permanent uh, damage to the UK steel sector. Here's just how dramatic price rises have been over the past year. Households are protected by the energy price cap. That was set when prices were 65p. They're now almost four times that. And businesses would like to see something similar put in place for them in order to protect them from the worst spikes in the global markets. But will it happen? To cushion businesses through this period, the business secretary says he's asked for help from the Treasury, something a Treasury source denies. Labour says the government needs to act. Businesses are tremendously worried, as are families. Everything's getting more expensive, fuel, energy costs, the weekly shop. And while all that's going on, we've got a government that's in chaos, isn't getting a grip on what's needed and is not taking action to protect businesses and support families at this time. Here, though, it's not the political ping-pong that matters, rather what the cost of energy might do to the price of a cup of tea. Katie Prescott, BBC News. Let's join our political correspondent, Jonathan Bake, now, who is at Westminster. So is there the prospect of support for businesses affected or not, Jonathan? Well, Michelle, although he acknowledged the situation was critical, there was no commitment today from the business secretary on any help from the government to companies struggling with energy costs. But what was revealing was the response from elsewhere in government to what he did say. No sooner had Kwasi Kwarteng suggested he'd been talking to the Treasury about possible financial help did the Chancellor's team fire off a response saying he'd been mistaken. A Treasury source telling us that they had not been engaged in specific talks about support for industry. On that, they said Kwasi Kwarteng 
had misspoken. Now, it is a pretty clear attempt to stamp on any suggestion that Rishi Sunak is ready to part with any taxpayers' cash here to help companies yet, at least, and a pretty brutal slapdown of the business secretary himself from number 11. Labour say this is farcical. They're accusing the cabinet of infighting at a time when the prime minister is away on holiday. The dire warnings from industry continue, but they, it seems, are no closer to getting the help they say they urgently need. Jonathan, thank you very much. Well, back now to our business correspondent, Katie Prescott, because just as we're talking about the energy price problem for steelmakers, one of them, Liberty Steel, has announced plans to reopen its plant in Rotherham. Katie, what's the background to this announcement? Yes, that's right. Well, this has been a while in the planning, and it's part of a broader restructuring of the Liberty Group that's been struggling with billions of dollars of debt since its main backer, Greensill Capital, collapsed in March. In terms of the importance of this particular plant, it's a, a supplier to a sister plant that Liberty's trying to sell. So the hope is that by keeping it open, by keeping workers in situ, it will show its viability and make it attractive to a buyer. But I should say, Buyers at the moment for the steel industry are in pretty short supply, as we've heard. It's a difficult time to be in steel with energy prices just as high as they are. The chink of light, though, is that production demand for steel has remained quite high. Prices are high as a result. And so the hope is that if the plant can keep going through this really difficult time, it may emerge stronger. It is worth saying this is just one plant within the broader group that is struggling with other challenges, not least an investigation by the serious fraud office. But certainly in Rotherham tonight, workers and their families will be celebrating at the confirmation of this. Katie Prescott, thank you. With the NHS winter flu jab campaign underway, there is a warning about the risk of catching both flu and COVID at the same time. Early evidence suggests that you are twice as likely to die if you become infected with both viruses. Those eligible for a flu jab are being encouraged to get it as soon as possible. Here's our health correspondent, Anna Collinson. Viruses are released into the air when people infected with flu or COVID-19 breathe out, speak, sing or sneeze. As this latest NHS campaign video warns, this winter will bring with it other dangers, not just COVID. With little flu virus circulating last year, there are warnings low immunity could result in tens of thousands of deaths. This is also the first winter where there will be significant amounts of flu and COVID. Research shows those infected with both viruses are twice as likely to die compared to COVID alone. We do know from the small amount of data that we've had previously that people are at more significant risk of, of death and of serious illness if they are co-infected with flu and with COVID. And that doesn't seem to be, from our studies, a fact which many of the public understand. Where are we now? In July, England became the first nation in Europe to fully unlock. Other countries have followed, but have taken a more cautious approach. As this graph shows, the UK has one of the highest COVID rates in Europe, well above that of France or Germany. But if you look at the daily COVID deaths, while the UK is still higher, a real concern for health leaders, the gap between the countries shrinks. This is an example of the power of the vaccination programme, providing vital protection to those most at risk. How will we cope this winter? The government hopes vaccines will protect us this winter, with more than two million booster jabs administered in England alone. To protect school children where infections are highest, COVID jabs are being rolled out to over 12s, while the flu vaccine is available to under 16s. Logistical problems, staff shortages and issues obtaining consent have caused delays, potentially to the end of November, and prompting calls for other measures like face coverings to be brought in. Vaccination will help eventually but it's happening very slowly in the younger teens. And the, the children un, under the, the, the age of 12 aren't being offered the vaccine anyway. Most children aren't seriously ill. Many don't have any symptoms at all. But enough of them have serious long-term consequences or serious illness or, or the knock-on effects that it really matters. It's feared even a small surge in demand could cause real problems for the NHS. But this stage of the pandemic has also been called one of the most difficult times to predict what's to come. Anna Collinson, BBC News.
And now to the latest official figures on coronavirus. There were 34,574 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means on average there were more than 37,000 new cases per day in the last week. As of Thursday, more than 6,500 people were being treated in UK hospitals with coronavirus. Another 38 deaths have been recorded of people who died within 28 days of a positive test result. On average, we've had 112 deaths a day in the past week. On vaccinations, 85.5% of the population aged 12 or over have had their first dose of a vaccine and 78.5% have been double jabbed. Divisions between the EU and the UK over the Northern Ireland Protocol look set to come to a head again this week. Ministers are trying to make significant changes to what they had agreed to under the terms of the Brexit deal. And the EU is due to put forward its own latest proposals. Let's speak to Jessica Parker, who's in Brussels. What is the latest then, Jessica, on what each side wants now? Well, in terms of what each side wants now, in some cases, quite different things. It was, of course, back in July that the UK set out its proposals to make significant changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. The protocol, agreed by both sides, is designed to prevent checks between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And the EU will this week bring forward its response. And it's expected to offer up some compromises. So reducing checks on goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, also allowing the continued import as well of chilled meats. Hence some of those headlines you might have heard about sausages. But on this issue of how the protocol is policed, Brussels is not expected to budge. The UK wants to remove the oversight role of the EU's top court, the European Court of Justice. That's a position Lord Frost, the UK's Brexit minister, will reiterate in a speech on Tuesday. So heading into the next week, these Brexit dividing lines are becoming clear. Jessica, thank you very much. Kim Jong-un will never give up his nuclear weapons, according to a former senior officer in North Korea's spy agency. Colonel Kim Kuk Song, who defected from North Korea, says he was involved in targeted attacks and assassinations and even built an illegal drugs lab for the leader. He's been speaking exclusively to our correspondent in Seoul, Laura Bicker. For decades, one family has maintained a brutal grip on North Korea. But occasionally, some slip through their grasp and reveal their secrets. North Korea's intelligence agency is the eyes, ears and brains of the supreme leader. Colonel Kim kuk Song spent 30 years in Pyongyang spy agencies. He defected in 2014, but has now, for the first time, decided to speak out. There are many cases where I directed spies to go to South Korea on missions. Many cases. He claims Kim Jong-un gave an order to kill off one of the leader's main critics. The target was this man, Hwang jang yop Back in 2009, he was a high-profile defector in South Korea. It was a gift to demonstrate Kim Jong-un's loyalty to his father. That's why this act of terror was organized. The attempt failed. Pyongyang always denied it was involved. Although some were caught, along with all their kit, the colonel claims agents infiltrated many areas of South Korean society, including in the early 1990s, the presidential office. This level of starvation is unprecedented. That same decade, as thousands of North Koreans starved in a disastrous famine, the colonel said the cash-strapped leader ordered him to produce and sell illegal drugs. I brought three foreigners into North Korea and built a base to produce crystal meth. All the money in North Korea belongs to Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. With that money, He'd build villas, buy cars, buy food, get clothes, enjoy the luxuries. As Pyongyang stepped up its weapons program, it too became a way to raise funds. I know that the operations department made arms deals with Iran. As for the types, special midget submarines, semi-submersibles, North Korea was very good at building cutting-edge weapons like this. North Korea continues to build and test new weapons and missiles. It's been accused of selling arms and technology to a number of countries, 
which it denies. Efforts to encourage the regime to disarm have repeatedly failed. The international community was excited when Kim Jong-un and Trump met, saying it was for denuclearization. But I didn't view it that way. In the end, denuclearization cannot be achieved. Why? North Korea's nuclear deterrent is tied to Kim Jong-un's survival. As the young dictator executed many of his political rivals, the colonel realized that he too was at risk. I was the reddest of the red, and to abandon my country and to escape to South Korea was the worst grief-stricken decision made in utter distress. While the colonel's account is impossible to verify, it serves as a timely reminder that the young leader has proved to be an adept dictator with only one goal in mind, the survival of his regime. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Seoul. Four people have been killed and a teenage boy seriously injured in a car crash on a country lane near Maidstone in Kent. The accident happened in the early hours of this morning. Kent police said that those who died were aged between 18 and 44. A 15-year-old boy who was a passenger in the car is in hospital with life-threatening injuries. A team of young female Afghan footballers who fled the country after the Taliban took control have been told that they can come to live in the UK with their families. 35 members of the Afghan women's development team, who are aged between 13 and 19, escaped from Kabul to Pakistan last month. The Home Office says it is finalising visas for the group. The UK is one of the most nature-depleted places on the planet. That's according to a new biodiversity study from the Natural History Museum, which looked at plant and animal life around the world and placed the UK well below the global average. Researchers said that there was little room for nature when land has been built on or used for farming. Olivia Richwold reports. Askenbog near York was formed by a retreating glacier 15,000 years ago. It's brimming with biodiversity, but a new report says that the UK is one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world, with just half of our biodiversity left. Biodiversity is also what provides us with so many of our basic needs. It's the foundation of our society. We've seen recently how disruptive it can be when supply chains break down. Nature is at the base of our supply chains. The UK's lack of biodiversity is linked to the Industrial Revolution. Intensive farming also plays its part. So what more can be done to protect special places like this? Last year, the Secretary of State turned down a plan to build 500 homes next door to this nature reserve. Askenborg is an extraordinary place. It holds between 5 and 10% of all the species in Britain, and yet if we don't do anything at all, we will lose more species than we already have from a place like this. If we do get it right, if we allow the wider countryside to become nature rich again, this is the place from which the surrounding land will be colonised. And that's true of all the other nature reserves across the country. Tomorrow, a global and virtual biodiversity conference begins, hosted by China. It'll set out plans to protect nature over the next 10 years. But the last time that goals were set a decade ago, none of them were met. Olivia Richwald, BBC News, New York. Time now for the sport. Let's join Sarah Mulcairns at the BBC Sports Centre. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much, Michelle. Tyson Fury declared himself as the greatest heavyweight boxer of his era, but said he would bask in his victory before deciding what next. He retained his WBC title, beating American Deontay Wilder in a fight that has been described as one of the best. Adi Adedoyan reports from Las Vegas. Tyson Fury remains the king of the ring. The self-styled Gypsy King conquering his fearsome rival Deontay Wilder in a gruelling seesaw battle which will go down in boxing folklore. Fury entered the arena dressed as a Roman centurion, perhaps fitting for what turned out to be a gladiatorial clash. And it was the champion who struck first. A round later, it was Fury's turn to be sent sprawling twice in quick succession. And that set the tone for the fight. Wilder looking out on his feet for much of it, but his fearsome punching power keeping him in contention. But it was Fury who closed the show. 
punch perfect, the decisive blows in the 11th round. There were some shaky moments in there, but I never lost faith. And I, I continued on, and I carried on and persevered. And uh, I got that single punch knockout. You know, as soon as I landed it, I jumped on the ropes. I knew it was over. He wasn't getting back up from that. You talked about shaky okay. moments. Um, he put you down uh, in the fourth round. Yeah. How did you get up from that? <sighs> Determination, God's will, and God's plan. Well, this will go down as one of the great nights in heavyweight boxing history. And the victory brings an emphatic end to this brilliant rivalry between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. It also keeps alive the hopes of Tyson Fury winning all the major belts in the division. Adi Adedoin, BBC News, Las Vegas. England have named their strongest possible cricket squad for the Ashes series this winter. A 17-man party will be led by Captain Joe Root after fears the strict COVID protocols in Australia would put some players off. Joe Wilson has more. The conversations between the cricketing nations continue. But as it stands, Joe Root will lead a full-strength England squad to Australia to try to win back the Ashes. Every player picked is fully committed, we're told. Did many of these players take a lot of persuading to get to this stage, Chris? Obviously, there's a lot of negotiations went on. Uh, but I think one thing that we did see was a lot of class from our captain. He showed a lot of class, a lot of empathy. So the bank and a lot of well real prepared, good leadership skills to get the players to this point. And I think what it has done is it's galvanised his position as a leader. Players like Joss Butler, who's in the squad, had stressed that travel arrangements for family were vital. Mark Wood will be England's fastest bowler in Australia, while Stuart Broad is selected as he recovers from injury. Ben Stokes isn't named. England will wait for him to be ready to play again. Well, never mind the challenges of COVID, think of the cricket. Australia won 4-0 the last time England toured there, 5-0 the series before that, down under. This winter, England will at least travel with the best players available. Unless, of course, things change. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Lewis Hamilton no longer leads the Drivers' Championship after Formula One's a Turkish Grand Prix. A disagreement with his team over a late pit stop saw him finish fifth. Valtteri Bottas won the race. Max Verstappen now leads the standings by six points after he finished second. St. Helens made history by becoming the first team to complete the treble with victory in the Women's Super League Grand Final. They beat the defending champions Leeds Rhinos 28-0. They had already won the Challenge Cup and league leaders shield this season. Arsenal maintained their winning start to the Women's Super League with a 3-0 victory over Everton. They stay top of the table with champions Chelsea in second after they beat Leicester 2-0. Wins two for Brighton and Reading. There's more on the BBC Sport website including the latest from the tennis at Indian Wells with Andy Murray on court. But that is it for me. Sarah, thank you very much. The first look at tomorrow morning's newspapers is coming up on the BBC News channel, but now on BBC One Time for the news wherever you are. Good night.